Well, welcome. As you know, this is an Institute for Digital Research in the Humanities sponsored event, which is relies on a tripod of the Hall Center for Humanities, the Libraries, and the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. Today, we're delighted to welcome Natalie Houston, who has cleverly picked a university that matches her <laughs> surname. Um, she's an associate professor of English, and her research on Victorian poetry and print culture has appeared in journals such as Victorian Studies, Victorian Poetry, and the Yale Journal of Criticism. She's the project di director of Visual Page, an NEH funded project to develop a software application to identify and analyze visual features in digitized print books, and she's currently writing a monograph entitled Reading Victorian Poetry Digital. Um, you can read her title up here, and we're really glad to here. Thank well, you. Thank you so much for this invitation. I'm really pleased to be here and have the chance to talk with you all about my current work. Excellent souvenirs already, and I haven't even given the talk. All right. Um, let me just set my stopwatch so that I will be able to track the time. OK. So over the last several years, the digitization of 19th century books and periodicals has dramatically increased our access to and awareness of the scope and diversity of Victorian print culture. The ease with which one can type a phrase into Google and pull up results from that historical archive in a fraction of a second belies the scale of work behind that search interface. Both the scope of the Google Books project, now at over 20 million books, and other library digitization efforts, and the scale of 19th century publishing, which, as we all know, vastly exceeded that of all previous periods. As individual readers, we have few opportunities and little capacity to truly engage with that kind of scale. We, the specialized readers in this room, have each read hundreds, perhaps thousands of books. But there are human limits of time, attention, and memory to contend with as that total number increases. Most of us can only read one text at a time, even if we switch among several different texts during a day or even during an hour and our ability to recall and make connections among them is no match for everything that's now available. So this new access to the incredible depth and diversity of 19th century print culture makes me wonder, along with Dan Cohen, should we be worrying that our scholarship might be anecdotally correct but comprehensively wrong? Is one or 10 or 100 or 1,000 books an adequate sample to know the Victorian? It might be that we want to read new books and authors we know nothing about, or that we want to continue reading those that are already familiar to academic study. But either way, taking scale into account can help us make more informed choices. Many literary scholars don't yet think of the texts they read as samples, adequate or not, um, but we use them to generate histories whose accuracy nonetheless depends upon our selection process. The problem of scale is especially important then for those of us working in historical fields because the texts we choose as our objects of study determine the kinds of histories we can write. And the histories that have already been written often determine the texts we choose, whether we seek to conform to or contest those existing histories. Beyond the question of sample size, how many books we should read, is the question of how we will read them. And the digital environment offers us not only access, new access to textual information, but also new modes of analysis. Of course, we all know that, as Franco Moretti notes, the traditional canon of Victorian literature includes only a minimal fraction of the literary field, constituted by all the texts published in the period. But until recently, there wasn't much we could do as human readers to move beyond our limited sampling ability. Moretti calls for new modes and methods of reading, what he calls distant reading, because a field this large cannot be understood by stitching together separate bits of knowledge about individual cases, because it isn't a sum of individual cases. It's a collective system that should be grasped as such as a whole. Moretti's use of the term distant reading intentionally positions large-scale statistical analysis of book titles, places mentioned in novels, and other kinds of data as the opposite of the close reading that many literary scholars practice. 
And that binarization, I think, too easily maps onto others between collaborative projects and individual insights, between new technologies and traditional methods, and between large prose texts and the short lyric poems favored by the new critics. Although I'm sympathetic to much of Moretti's work, the questions I'm interested in demand more flexible negotiation and combination of those poles sketched by those oppositions. So it's worth noting here that when literary scholars use the term reading, particularly in the formulations of close or distant, we often conflate research and interpretation into one iterative and recursive activity. We already have hypotheses before we ever sit down to read a text. And our subsequent reading is in fact an, a testing of those hypotheses and an iterative rewriting of them as we encounter new information and notice new patterns. And the development of humanistic knowledge depends upon this iterative recursive blurring of the boundaries between hypothesis, data collection, experimentation, and analysis. Those are distinct in some of the scientific fields. In the humanities, we call all of that reading. In digital reading, this process, I would argue, is supported by the computer's ability to count, store, recall, and display information in a variety of ways beyond what humans can do. So I've been suggesting this definition of digital reading as methods of literary research and interpretation that draw upon computational analysis to move beyond human limitations of vision, memory, and attention. And what I'm calling digital reading is closely aligned with what Steve Ramsey has described as algorithmic criticism. But we read before we enter the rhetorical space of critique. And I'm interested in the methods we use and choices we make during that process of professional reading, be it close, distant, or digital. OK, why Victorian poetry? It's no accident that Dante Rossetti and William Blake were the focus of two pioneering digital archives. Those poets' hybrid multimedia texts could not be adequately represented or contained within the conventional form of the Codex scholarly edition. But generally speaking, poetry, and especially Victorian poetry, has been underrepresented in more recent work in the digital humanities, as our focus has tended to shift from textual editing to textual analysis. Even with the most basic text string searching, an unwieldy 800-page novel becomes available for different kinds of thematic or linguistic analysis than reading unassisted by a concordance or word search or word index. At the level of scale, the payoff for computationally analyzing Dickens novels seems obvious in ways that analyzing short lyric poems may not. But of course, Victorian poems, can you still hear me over the, okay. Victorian poems weren't all short, and they weren't all lyrics. And the question of scale is, I think, part of the complicated history of why Victorian poetry was given short shrift not only by the modernist poets who followed, but also by many 20th century scholars in Victorian studies. That poetry itself became, for many years, nearly synonymous with the short personal lyric. And in the academic setting, this is what, um, you know, this is due to the hegemony of what Jerome McGann termed romantic ideology. Um, which brought with it a set of prescriptions for what kind of reading was appropriate to poetry. To read a sonnet as the new critics taught us to read John Donne, for instance, is for many people the exemplar of close reading. But it won't get you very far if you're reading Elizabeth Barrett Browning's Aurora Lee. Victorian poetry encompassed long narrative or dramatic poems, poems that responded to current events and could not be well understood without those reference. Old verse forms adapted to new historical circumstances and new aesthetic mappings of sound and sense. Because Victorian poetry doesn't conform to modernist or romantic ideals, it became somewhat illegible, unreadable, for a large portion of the 20th century. My work restores Victorian poetry to our attention within both Victorian studies and the digital humanities by exploring what digital reading of poetic texts can tell us about the prevalence and function of poetry within Victorian culture, and about gaps and biases in our existing digital humanities tool sets. So the larger work this talk is drawn from consists of three interrelated projects. First, the construction of a database for analyzing bibliographic metadata for single author books of poetry published between 1840 and 1900. The development of a set of tools for the computational analysis of graphic or visual elements in digitized page images and a set of experiments using text analysis tools to read Victorian poems. 
And in the remainder of my time this afternoon, I'm going to be focusing on the first two of those, although I'm happy to talk about the third in the Q&A if you're interested. So first, let's think about books in the world. And whether among specialists like ourselves or in more general usage, literary history tends to be thought of as a chronological list of writers or a list of texts. Um, and, the, and the very form of the list contains embedded within it an ideology that John Guillory describes as collapsing the history of canon formation into an autonomous history of literature, which is always a history of writers and not of writing. A history of writing would, by contrast, have to pose first the question of what genres of writing count as literature in a given historical context. One of the ways to begin exploring the history of writing, as opposed to the history of writers, is to expand outwards from specific examples, the writers who are already on our lists, to the view afforded us by large-scale analysis. So as an example, a standard list of Victorian poets usually includes these seven, right? Tennyson, Robert Browning, Matthew Arnold, Dante Rossetti, Swinburne, Christina Rossetti, and Elizabeth Barrett Browning. Um, this uh, is a synchronic slice for the year of 1875, um, showing um, there are 75 total books by or about these seven poets published in that year. And this shows the relative percentage, so Tennyson takes up the most space in that view of 1875. And this, is, and this is a pretty good glimpse of what our syllabi tend to look like and so forth. Um, and, but if we only look at that short list of, um, oh, sorry, let me back up. Let me show you this first. Um, this gives you the diachronic view. So you can't read the numbers where you are. But this shows those same seven poets, um, books by and about them published between 1855 and 1880. Um, and so seeing all seven together is less helpful, except that the, you know, there, there were a lot of books about and by poets. Um, but it's really helpful to compare poets like Tennyson, the Blue Line, who was always present in the cultural field. Um, and, poets like Christina Rossetti, the intermittent short red line. Okay. Um, but if we only look at those seven poets, we aren't seeing the whole picture. So this is 1875 again, in a bar graph that is a both terrible example of a data visualization and a wonderful example of my point. Um, this, these, are the, the, these tiny little smudges of blue are the um, counts of books by and about those seven poets. Um, and that's the total number of books by and about poetry of all, by all poets in that same year, approximately 1,300 items. They don't fit on the same scale, OK? There's so much we don't know about all the books that are in that space between those seven poets we know very well and all those other poets we know next to nothing about. And that's what I'm interested in, exploring. The list assumes a metonymic relation between writers and literary tradition. And the conceptual model of the literary field, on the other hand, maps a network of relationships and forces. My work is rooted in Pierre Bourdieu's notion of the field of cultural production as a space of struggle and dynamic change, constituted by the structural relations existing among various individual agents and cultural institutions at a particular historical moment. Bourdieu models culture as a structure of positions and position takings that express and create judgments of economic, social, and aesthetic value. And within this structure of actions and decisions that produce a work of art and its cultural value, every position, he says, even the dominant one, depends on the other positions constituting the field. Thus, the structures of cultural value that surrounded Tennyson's In Memoriam, or Christina Rossetti's Goblin Market and other poems, or any other book of Victorian poetry, were partly created by all the other books of poetry that circulated during the period. And, as Bourdieu notes, one of the major difficulties of the social history of philosophy, art, or literature is that it has to reconstruct these spaces of original possibles, and that's how it's translated in English, which, because they were part of the self-evident givens of the situation, remain unremarked and are therefore unlikely to be mentioned in contemporary accounts, chronicles, or memoirs. The stuff that circulates in culture and is so obvious to the people of that historical moment does not always get 
remarked. But it's part of how value is assigned. My database project is one step towards such a reconstruction of the cultural field of Victorian poetry. So for this project, I'm collecting bibliographic metadata. Um, metadata describe the book as a physical object in the world. So this includes the cit basic citational information of author, title, publisher, place, date. And it can also include other information about the physical book, the number of pages, the presence of a preface or an appendices, um, descriptive notes or provenance information for a particular copy. Library catalogs and enumerative bibliographies are good existing sources for this metadata, but they vary widely in what they record and how they present this information. And enumerative listings, like these WorldCat results, are very effective for what they're designed to do, help you locate specific items, typically books held within a library. And even though you can now easily search some library catalogs and databases with hyperlinked metadata terms, like author names, for example, the information is always given back to us in a linear format that distinguishes specific items rather than connecting related ones. So the process of transforming this existing bibliographic metadata from the linear format of the list into the relational format of the database will allow me to ask, and I hope eventually to answer, some research questions that traditional catalogs can't currently address. Like, in which decade was the largest number of new books of poetry published? How many of those poets were women? Which publishers were most active in publishing poetry between 1850 and 1875? I can't yet give you the answers to those questions, but those are the kinds of things I'm curious to discover as I collect more comprehensive information and put it in a relational format. So if we want to move beyond the list of writers that we are already familiar with, the first research challenge is simply to find the poetry. Um, in research libraries, for example, those following the Library of Congress system, most books of poetry are cataloged under author names, which are filed under the national categories, like PR for British literature. If you know the names of authors, then it's easy to find their works. But it's much more difficult to go looking for a specific genre, form, or kind of literature. In library catalogs, for example, poetry is only going to show up in the metadata if words like poems, poetry, verse, sonnet, elegy, and so forth appear in a title, summary, or note. Books about poetry, then, are much easier to find than the books of poems themselves, if you don't already know the authors you're looking for, which is my project. Um, so you have to define what you're looking for, um, define the scope of the search, both in terms of place, language, and time period, and then develop protocols for cleaning that data. Um, I'm working with the research API with the WorldCat um, database um, and have been developing a whole series of search protocols in order to, to get enough data and then clean it up. Um, and so where this will lead um, is to enable us to explore the network of relationships that constituted the cultural field of poetry in the 19th century. So this is a network graph for the year 1866. This, this shows about 550 books of poetry. Um, the nodes on this graph are publishers and poets sized by the number of connections between them, which represent the actual books published in that year. So here I've highlighted four, the four publishers most heavily represented in this data for this one year, 1866. No surprise to the Victorianists in the room, um, Macmillan, Rutledge, Bell and Daldy, Simkin and Marshall. Um, two of those publishers, of course, still very active, very much with us today, although in a slightly different form. Um, approximately 120 items in this set are library catalog records that lack any publisher name. Um, so that's actually the largest node in this graph is the null for publisher. Um, some of those items are privately printed. They don't have a set, a set publisher. Some may have missing information. Some may have been cataloged incorrectly. Working with metadata means by definition that you're working with data someone else has created, which then gives you a variety of different complications. Um, so one of my interests is in understanding the limits of our academic canon for Victorian poetry. So I'm especially interested in tracking books of poetry by 19th century authors. But the cultural field of poetry during this period was also shaped by editions 
of works of other poets, earlier poets. So here I've highlighted the authors with works published at three or more different publishers in the year 1866. And you'll see many of these are um, poets from much earlier periods, right? Um, Homer, Milton, and so forth. Although very popular 19th century poets, Longfellow, Tennyson, um, are also represented here. Um, so this shows us how those categories of particular kinds of authors had a different impact in structuring the literary field. Um, and this is the alternative view of the same data. So those blue nodes are the ones I just showed you highlighted, but I've marked all the other, the one-to-one -one relationships with orange nodes. Um, as interesting as it may be to see which publishers published the largest number of books in a given year or which authors had the most books in a given year, most Victorian poets would only publish one book in a year if they were lucky. And it turns out that most publishers were only publishing one book of poetry in a given year. So aside from those, the, the, the top 10 or 15 publishers who we all are already familiar with, there are hundreds of other publishers that we, know, we don't know very much yet about their publishing of poetry. Um, how consistent it was, what kinds of poetry they specialized in, what audience they were publishing for. Okay. Um, and of course, volume publication was not the only form in which poetry circulated. And eventually I'll be adding in other layers of analysis such as publication in periodicals and newspapers. This work opens up a lot of research questions about the perceived affiliations among groups of poets, the aesthetic or political horizons associated with particular publishers, and the consistent presence of poetry throughout the Victorian period. Gathering accurate metadata and building a database that we can query for meaningful patterns is a starting point for understanding the Victorian literary field and its structures of value. And so this work is the foundation for my two other interrelated projects. Um, so once we've identified all those books of poetry, how can we read them computationally? So I'm going to move now to talking about the visual page project. Um, so the starting point, the, the key idea behind this project and the software that uh, we're developing um, is that all printed texts simultaneously convey meaning through both linguistic and graphic signs. And so as Jerome McGann tells us in Radiant Textuality, text documents, while coded bibliographically and semantically, are all marked graphically. And that a page of printed or scripted text should thus be understood as a certain kind of graphic interface. So words printed on a book's title page, for example, communicate linguistic content, such as the book's title and the author's name, that is made more meaningful through the conventions, the graphic conventions of book publishing. And these graphic conventions convey culturally encoded meaning about the importance, audience, and function of the linguistic content on the page and by extension of the entire book. So the spatial arrangement of text and white space, typeface size and attributes, and the sequencing of the page within the book all combine to tell us that this is a title page. Um, it's not the words, it's not the linguistic content alone. Um, and of course, there are plenty of novels in the 19th century, George Eliot's Adam Bede, for instance, where the title could just as well be an author's name if you didn't, if you didn't have those visual codes that are also telling you things. Um, obviously, there are other codes here um, with a religious imagery on the title page that are, t that are also signifying things about the book's um, intended audience and its content. Experienced readers assess, categorize, and evaluate the graphical or visual codes of printed texts very quickly, often subconsciously. And as Johanna Drucker suggests, we see before we read. And the recognition thus produced predisposes us to reading according to specific graphic codes before we engage with the language of the text. And so you knew almost instantly that the page image on the right was of a poem. How we distinguish, I mean, we know poetry because of conventions of printing, conventions of white space. How we distinguish among the semantic, bibliographic, and graphic levels of a text always already constitutes an act of interpretation. And McGann suggests that these distinctions are inevitably marked for attention or for inattention in our scholarship. By using the language of the mark, 
of graphical action and of digital text markup, McGann suggests that the history of scholarship imprints its values upon the object of study in ways that shape future readings. Much of what we know about Victorian material textuality is based on highly specific studies of individual figures, Dickens, Thackeray, William Morris, Oscar Wilde. And those studies tell us a lot about the particular aesthetics, politics, or creative ambition of individual writers. It also privileges those figures about whom we know a lot, those figures who are already well represented in the scholarly archive, and especially those like Morris or Dickens who we know to have been actively involved in publishing practices one way or another. But what about all those other Victorian books that I was just showing you in the network graph? Those that weren't especially decorated or that didn't make it into our shrunken Victorian canon. These books also have a graphical material dimension that shaped the reading experience of their first readers. And examining the material aspects of non-canonical and less obviously self-conscious books contributes to a broader sociological understanding of literature's circulation and function within the Victorian period. To recall Bourdieu's language, the often unremarked bibliographical and graphical elements of Victorian books that McGann would say are marked for inattention, nonetheless signified cultural strategies and possibilities for their original readers. Johanna Drucker, along with McGann, argues for defamiliarizing the printed page so that we can perceive its essentially graphic nature as well. But some of the most compelling examples of such readings that both Drucker and McGann have offered have centered on the work of William Morris, as in this visually elaborate Kelmscott Press page, which is the example Drucker uh, discusses in her article on white space. But this seems almost too obvious. When we look at the Kelmscott Chaucer, our visual or graphic attention is invariably activated. We know that this is a page that demands to be seen as well as read, and in fact, to be seen over and above reading, right? Morris was not designing these Kelmscott Press books um, for legibility. There were other factors at work in his choice. But the same holds true for all printed texts, not just those like this one that are highly decorated, because printed words function as images, as Laura Mandel suggests. Looking at a set of graphic marks set off by the frame of white space involves the same cognitive processes as would looking at any image. So I'm interested in those ordinary books of poetry, the previously unremarked. So I'm going to show you some typical books of poetry. These are all examples from the 1860s, um, so that you can get a sense of what these books actually looked like. On poem openings, as here, the space above the title extends approximately one third to one half of the page. I think the projector is really bleaching out. There is a darker background against which you should be able to see these white pages, but from where I'm standing, it, yeah, it's bleached it out quite a lot. Okay, forgive, forgive the slides. There should be, you should be able to see page edges around the scanned sheet. And I'm not sure if I can adjust that from here. All right, I'm not gonna try. Um, Titles are often uh, noted with capital letters, subsequent poem pages. The top margin is much smaller, usually filled with informational running heads and page numbers. The first line of the poem is sometimes marked with dropped capital letters, which attract or direct the eye. Um, many books use no page numbers for, pa for poem openings. Um, some put a, a page number centered in the top uh, margin and then followed by alternating corner placement on subsequent pages. And of course, not all books begin new, each poem on a new page. And so here are two examples of how poems are separated, sometimes with ornaments, sometimes just with spacing and poem titles. The visual appearance of the main text area of the page depends, of course, in part on the verse form of the poem. But even within the small and manageable example of the sonnet, 14 lines rhymed in a set pattern, there can be graphical variations. So, Two, two sonnets, both printed by, in books um, published by Macmillan, both with the lines all left justified. Um, but in Matthew Arnold's, the condensed sonnet form is separated into separate stanzas, which is a, a print convention that, ex that emphasized the fact that he follows the strict Italian form of the sonnet, which Turner does not. Um, here, two more sonnets, 
with the lines indented to mark the rhymes. And line indentation often visually represents linguistic aspects of poetic form. So you can see that this is a Shakespearean or English formed sonnet with the alternating rhyme. Um, this one is a little more complicated because you also have a dropped capital letter and line nine is too long to fit the width of the page and so it's got a hanging indent. Um, but it's got the distinctive shape of the Italian sonnet form. So poetic form was visible on the page in the 19th century. Um, again, something that would be registered by experienced readers um, before they actually ever read the linguistic text of the poem. Um, a few of the books that I'm working with uh, are illustrated books, but they often have ornaments at, at poem openings or section openings. Um, decorative initial capital letters are very common at mid-century, um, often in this kind of black letter or faux medieval style, sometimes in a more modern aestheticized style. Um, but what I've just showed you is based on a limited survey of Victorian books of poetry because it was performed by a human being, me. I've looked at a few hundred books of poetry or their digitized equivalents um, for this project, and there are many more that I'll, I would be analyzing in order to develop a, you know, more of a taxonomy of their visual features. But as a human reader, my perceptions are changing inevitably as I go through that process. I notice some things and I stop noticing others. And it's only by being able to look for similarities, differences, and patterns. And again, the projector's really wrecking my slides. Um, but to begin seeing poems on the page as shapes, and to begin trying to figure out how they might be grouped together um, by their visual features. Um, by doing that, we can be, by seeing those patterns, we can begin to understand what is historically representative and what is unique. Uh, but as a human reader, I can only analyze a limited number of texts. The computer can analyze thousands without becoming tired, forgetful, or aesthetically biased, unless we program it to do so. So how to do this? We already have tools for the computational analysis of the linguistic layers of digitized text. But as I've been suggesting, texts signify through their bibliographical and visual layers as well. And scholars have realized that typographic transcriptions abstract texts from the artifacts in which they are versioned and embodied. Obviously, for certain kinds of research questions, there's no substitute for access to the printed book and to multiple copies of those books, as Andrew Stouffer has been arguing. A full material analysis of a book, including precise page measurements, bibliographic collations, paper watermark and provenance identification, analysis of the binding, we can't do that from a digital surrogate. Sometimes we need to handle the actual material objects. But there is so much more we could do with those digital images that we do have of books pages. Page images offer researchers more information about the interaction of the book's physical characteristics with its signifying strategies than textual extraction can alone. That's why most scholarly digital archives today recognize that value and provide users access to both digitized page images and text transcriptions. Um, and because of the recent digitization projects um, have taken photographic scans of book pages, the graphical meaning of books is available with varying levels of fidelity for a very large corpus of digitized items. If we are to adapt scholarship to the large scale that digitization makes possible, we need new ways of conceptualizing and analyzing that digital surrogate. So that's what led to the Visual Page Project, um, which is a, a fully collaborative project between myself and Neil Audenert, who's a computer science, uh, scientist at Texas A&M University. Um, we're funded by a level two startup grant from the NEH, um, and the grant is to develop a prototype software for the, the computational analysis of digitized page images. We're using a very small data set um, of 300 single author books of poetry derived from that uh, bibliographic database work that I was describing um, as our starting point for this proof of concept development. So image analysis um, is, is the sort of large category for what, um, what we're working within 
So there's been a lot of prior work on image analysis with the goals of taking a scanned page and producing something useful. When something useful has been defined only as extracting words from that page. Um, and so this is what your OCR software does, essentially. And rather than reinventing it, we're, we're simply repurposing what OCR software already does. Um, so we're building the work, the development work we're doing is built on top of Tesseract, which is the open source OCR optical character recognition software that Google um, has put out. So OCR software looks at a page and then starts recognizing where there's text and where there isn't and dividing up that text into lines, words, and then characters and matching that up um, so that it can translate pixels into text characters. Okay. And so we're using that layout analysis that OCR software does, which then once it gives you your characters, it throws that away. And we're taking that and repurposing it to layout understanding. So we're matching up that layout analysis that the OCR engine can provide with what the formal features that we have identified in pages of printed poetry. So the documents then get modeled in this way. Um, looking at the layout analysis and then we are computing quantitative values for those distinct features um, identified in that layout understanding. Um, so some of those features include line height, line width, the letting, the amount of space between lines, um, margins, the indentation, both the mean and the standard um, deviation for indentation of lines within a given page. The foreground ratio of black pixels to white space on the, on the page. Um, and then we're, we're currently you know, exploring a few other features as well. Some of these are features that are at the book level. Some of them are at the page level, um, at the line level. So this is sort of an overview. You start with the source image. Um, put it through um, our modified OCR software um, and extract then from it a set of quantitative feature values and then add, combine that with metadata, historical metadata um, to allow for further um, pattern identification, classification and analysis. Um, user interaction is another big area of development for this project so we're still in the process of building our web interface but um, key things will be the ability for users to select from the documents set um, by features like line length or page density and have those changes in their document selections reflected in the workspace. Um, also as part of that the controls we're building are themselves information um, devices so that each one shows you the range of values for the given feature that you'd be selecting among. Um, I want to talk a little bit, I mean, so this is, this is proof of concept software. Our grant runs through the end of December. We're, it's, we're still in the process of development. But based on where we are currently with this work, I want to sketch a few directions for possible humanities research um, and how I see a tool like Visual Page contributing to my work in 19th century studies. Um, so, Discovery is an important aspect of how tools like Visual Page contribute. Um, and in particular, this tool allows researchers to um, see similarities and differences in, between sets of printed materials, um, to trace historical changes in printed materials, and patterns of influence and imitation. So for instance, um, I can look at a set of, of books that we've loaded into the, into the system and, you know, identify which of these books use ornamental capital letters as a, as a distinct feature. Um, and then, you know, be able to actually see representative pages from different documents. Um, and then, and one of the things in our user interactions, um, you're seeing some of the other parts of that mock-up, um, is to be able to move fluidly from page level or document level exploration back to the larger set. It's a real challenge if you're trying to work with large data sets. How can users actually navigate those, make sense of them in ways 
that are still true to humanist understanding of the text. Um, although I'm really interested in those, in those um, data frames of quantitative values, most uh, humanist researchers are not going to be. That's not the easiest way to make sense of this material. And it's visual material. We want to provide visual exploration of the large data set. Um, another area that I'm especially interested in right now is that, as I've been suggesting, I think, in some of my other remarks, visual features of printed texts can be used to identify poetic forms. And just as it's almost impossible or very difficult to find the poetry in the library catalog, to find examples of a particular poetic form within a set of books is very difficult unless you're only working with, oh, well, yes, I know Robert Browning wrote dramatic monologues, so we'll go look for dramatic monologues, um, which then tends to replicate the knowledge we already have rather than expanding that knowledge out. So um, blank verse, for instance, has a very distinctive look on the page left justified lines, long lines of poetry, um, and they tend to be very full pages of text as well. So those are all things that I can identify in the quantitative values that we've collected and use that to find all the examples of blank verse in our document collection. That's something I couldn't do otherwise. Okay? And I'm in the process of developing algorithmic ways of finding other kinds of verse forms. The sonnet is another one because it has a very defined form. Um, other, other verse forms in the Victorian period especially are much looser, um, but it's interesting to see how the computer can help you identify what is actually consistent in the visual representation of particular verse forms. Um, and getting at this information visually um, is actually more efficient in many respects than trying to get at it from the linguistic text alone. Um, most of our linguistic text searching tools um, strip out line breaks and a, a lot of other features that make poetry what it is. So finding the blank verse is really challenging through linguistic an analysis alone. Um, this tool also allows us to reframe <coughs> our knowledge, um, to explore the unremarked texts um, that surrounded the others that we're already familiar with. Um, and to measure and identify distinctive features or distinctive books, and the corollary to measure and identify representative or typical features or books. Um, are questions that are really important to me, going back to those things I was saying earlier about selection and significance and the academic canon. Um, John Gray's Silver Points is a famous example of decadent aestheticist poetic production at the end of the 19th century. And you can see, this is a very unusual looking book. And it was deliberately designed by Charles Ricketts, one of the great book designers in the 1890s. Um, it's like eight and nine sixteenths inches by four inches. It's a, it's a very strange shape modeled on, a, on an old Persian um, form of the book. Um, he's using a Caslon um, typeface in an italic variant. Um, which is modeled on a 16th century Venetian design. Um, it, and this book had amazing um, binding and the paper, everything about it announced its status as an aestheticist precious item. Um, and, and this is, and this, most especially, the reversal of the usual ratio of text and margin. This is the book that, that prompted Oscar Wilde's friend Ada Leverson to tell him that he should write a book that was all margin that had, was nothing but beautiful blank pages. Um, the ultimate aestheticist book, right? So we already know that Silver Points is an unusual book. But having spent some time looking at white space and the arrangement of text and white space in typical books, as we've just been doing this afternoon, helps us see exactly in what ways this is an unusual book. And what kind of visual codes Gray and Ricketts were combating and reworking in their poetic collaboration. Um, you didn't have to be an, aesthetic, an aestheticist, or an aesthete, rather, um, to see that this book was doing things differently. Um, but only by looking at the broader context can we really fully understand how something like this is doing things differently. Finally, like Johanna Drucker, I want to defamiliarize our approach to the book. Um, and I'm interested in how the computer can show us things that we couldn't otherwise see. So 
I'm going to, this is um, a graph of the mean of line length per page in William Allingham's 50 Modern Poems. So there's 200 and some pages to the book, and the marks on the graph show you the line lengths per page. So one of the things we can see, and I've added that smoothing um, lowest curve so you can see the shape of the, of the data, um, there's a lot of variation. Okay, Allingham's book of 50 modern poems, and I, the Victorians were the first people to call themselves modern. And so this is a really interesting book for lots of reasons. Um, lots of different poetic forms in this book. Okay. Um, and graphs like this, this is an unusual way of thinking about the book, but they help us see something about its contents that we couldn't otherwise see. Um, oh, one thing I did want to point out, when I, pull, when I ran this graph, um, one of the things I did notice, this strange uptick at the end, it was, uh, you know, pages that don't match anything else. And it turns out when you go to the book, indeed, the last 26 pages are publishers' advertis advertisements. And so they don't match anything else in the book. Um, so there's possibilities, this is just totally a tangent, but there are possibilities of using this technology to locate materials that are visually distinct within a miscellany, for instance. Um, but we can use this kind of defamiliarization to compare to two or more books. Matthew Arnold's book of new poems is much more formally consistent. Um, the line lengths are much more similar to one another. Um, and one could begin to use that kind of information as a starting point for a comparative exploration, particularly when you broaden it out from two to the many. This is only 18, but if you've got several hundred of these sort of stylistic fingerprints um, visualized in this way, um, it opens up really new and provocative ways of thinking about how poetry looked on the page, how poetry circulated, um, and the kinds of um, variation and consistency you see. Um, one last sort of set of examples. Um, looking at, and this is just looking at foreground ratio, so text on the page, not even calculating in line length um, and, and other features that we have extracted values for. Um, you can use this to look at the range of variation within a given book. So, in Sophia Eckley's book, Minor Chords, the page with the least amount of text on it, the page with the most amount of text on it, and the average um, page of this particular book of poetry. So b trying to figure out what does a typical page of a book look like? What does a typical book of a group by this particular publisher look like? What does a typical book for a particular decade look like? Are all questions that we can approach quantitatively through this tool. Um, Christina Rossetti's Prince's Progress, the page with the least amount of text on it, which is you know, four lines at the end of a poem, the page with the most amount of text, and the average page. Um, and what's really interesting is when you then put next to one another the average pages from works by different poets, what you begin to see. How the you know, arrangement of lines on the page can begin to serve as an index to differences in poetic style. Now, obviously, this would not be the only thing one would want to use to investigate poetic style. But if you're looking at the, the very big picture of hundreds or thousands of books, it helps. we can use the computer to then take this kind of information and create categories and clusters from which we can then dig into the linguistic contents um, and linguistic patterns that make up poetic style. Um, and you know, it also raises questions about reading experience. How might the perception of a crowded or sparsely text, uh, sparsely printed page um, affect the reading experience. Um, so very quickly, our startup goal is by the end of the year, we'll be finishing the web interface, um, extending the data analysis, and publishing the complete code base um, on GitHub. Um, and at the, in the broader areas for further research, I'm interested in exploring how visual analytics can contribute to large scale <coughs> historical understanding how visual analytics can be combined with text analysis, topic modeling, and so forth, as I was just suggesting, I think, a minute ago, and how to expand this research to other kinds of printed material. Um, what machine learning and pattern classification techniques would be helpful, um, and the statistical models you know, uh, for printed works are rather different than for other kinds of um, statistical analysis. 
how we can design search interfaces to support exploration and research with very large document sets, and how to design for scalability of both the data and the analysis are all problems we want to explore as we continue this research further um, with further funding that we hope to get. Um, so digital reading can help us examine familiar texts in new ways, to identify unfamiliar texts, and to open up new ways of conceptualizing the relations among texts, linguistic, bibliographic, and visual codes. And as I've hoped to suggest today, digital reading thus enables us to move beyond our individual human limitations so as to better understand the objects and ideas of the humanities at the larger scale. Thank you. So I would be delighted to answer questions. We've got about half an hour for the discussion. Um, so have you done any scholarship based on what you've done? I mean, you were talking about moving from this statistical or com computational um, information to, to linguistic analysis. Mm -hmm. Has it helped you to do that, or is that something you're projecting down the line? I'm in early stages of doing some of that work. So the third, the third project, which I didn't talk about in the, in the formal talk, um, are, are a set of experiments using text analysis tools for poetry. So I'm particularly looking at a few features of Victorian um, poetic stylistics. So um, rhyme patterns. Um, line enjambment, um, word choice, um, vocabulary richness is the statistical measure of that, um, and repetition are, are all very simple things to um, analyze computationally, or relatively simple. Rhyme is a little complicated. Um, and they begin to give us ways of talking about um, comparative analysis that critics already do, but we don't have um, firm grounds for it. So we all know that Christina Rossetti is a very different kind of poet than Elizabeth Barrett Browning, or the Victorianists in the room all know this. Um, and we might be able to show in particular poems and so forth, but to be able to begin to derive a measure for that that can then be used to explore the works of other poets, the unknown poets, um, is for me a really interesting Avenue. I'm early on in that work, but absolutely, this work every day opens up my eyes to things I did not know about poetry's circulation, poetry's function in the period, poets and publishers that we know nothing about, um, and that for me are worth knowing about in order to better understand what Victorian poetry was at all. Yeah. So you are one of your um, early headings was why Victorian poetry and mm -hmm. you were um, talking about the uh, I think about the um, the poor visibility of that field in general. Yes. And I'm wondering even like going beyond Victorian poetry, mm -hmm. that's that's a that's the sort of condition of poetry um, yeah. both, you know, for contemporary poets and for the historical study of it and the literary study of it. And I'm I'm trying to think about how this kind of work, um, I mean, how, practically speaking, it can make an intervention there. So I mean, thinking about trying to teach poetry to undergraduates, beginning undergraduates, right, and to give, I mean, what they they look at this, you know, they look at this text that they can't understand, and you want to make it both. In, you know, give them a you know a tool to make sense of it, but but also um, try to convince them that it's worth making sense of it, right? That there's a there's a there's a kind of uh, human and social motivation mm -hmm. to doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. So how how can you bring um, DH work on poetry and poetry of this period? 
to that problem, I guess, that has been sort of put very sort of crudely. Well, one of, one of the ways, I mean, one of the ways I approach this in my own classroom, for instance, um, is by sh showing students poetry's role in popular culture in the 19th century. Um, and one of the ways of doing that is showing poetry's appearance in periodicals and newspapers. There were poems published every week in the London Times, right next to the weather report and the statistics on sewers. And all, there, are, there are poems. And some of those are poems about current events, and some of them are imitations of Tennyson, and some of them are very good, and some of them are terrible. But there, there's poems in the newspaper. And students are kind of surprised by that. Yeah. Okay? Um, so at a very simple level, um, the digitization of periodicals and newspapers gives us access to all this material. And um, tools like this that can help us find those materials more easily um, are, one, are one way of doing that. Um, and basic text analysis tools also help give students ways of working with poems. So um, we read a lot of long narrative Victorian poems in my classes. Um, Aurora Lee is a great favorite with students because it's got a plot and characters and it's, you know, it's, it's a novel in verse. Um, but we have very successfully done experiments with um, just very simple word frequencies, right? What words are used most frequently in a given book of that eight book poem? Um, and that gives students an, another way of thinking about it, another way of manipulating this thing that can sometimes feel very familiar because it's sort of like a novel, and other times feel very alien. I want to maintain the alienness of poetry, but also give students ways in to reading it. And so um, I see DH tools as just one of an arsenal of approaches that can help students get more comfortable working with poetry. We have done some terrible things in the teaching of poetry to make students scared of it. Um, and so we often start with pop, pop songs and country music lyrics, which use refrain and repetition and puns and irony. And you know, if they can get a little comfortable analyzing pop music, then we can move into Tennyson. Yes, Peter. I, I have a very basic question, uh, and it has to do with World Cat. So you're using mm -hmm. World Cat as the basis, and, and how reliable is that as sort of a reflection of what is out there? And you were talking about private printings in particular. So, it, I mean, does World Cat? contain all that? Okay, my, my database will never be comprehensive. Right. So that's, the, you know, but it can be better than what we currently have. And WorldCat's not the only thing I'm using. We have a couple of, of published bibliographies of poetry, um, which are not, you know, they're, they're, they're uh, you know, along with WorldCat and along with the British Library catalogs. Um, you know, the British Library gives us a, a pretty good, um, approach to the, the main published things rather than privately printed items, for, for instance. Um, and sure, there's always going to be things that aren't in there. But um, it's pretty good. And it's certainly, I mean, it's so much larger than what we as poetry scholars have been looking at. I mean, the specialists in Victorian poetry, we maybe talk about 80 poets, maybe, maybe 100. You know, and, but we tend to talk about, about 30 to 40 poets over and over again. And there's hundreds of poets that we don't know anything about. So this is just, this is an attempt to begin to broaden our horizons. Um, WorldCat is the um, consortium of libraries, research libraries. So it's what your interlibrary loan librarians use to um, borrow books from other institutions. Um, the data in there is created by cataloging librarians at those individual institutions. Um, and the quality of that cataloging data varies considerably, especially depending if you're looking at books that were accessioned um, in the late 19th century versus books that were um, purchased or, or donated to a library more recently. Um, so there's a lot of messiness in that information, absolutely. And so the protocols for refining that data um, or something I'm, I'm definitely still working through. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, John. I have 19 questions. Excellent. Uh, with three follow-ups each. Okay, I, I will take notes. So I'm going to forego my question about Marx for a second. 
And I want to ask you a couple of shop questions. Okay. So, um, are you, so when you talk about doing topic modeling, have you started any of that? And if so, like, what's that look like? What's that process been like? Um, I have only done very rudimentary topic models yet. Um, and I'm not convinced that topic modeling, although it is the hottest thing going right now, I'm not convinced that um, we as humanist scholars yet have a good handle on what to do with the results of our topic models. So for those of you not in on topic modeling, um, it's a, it's a means by which you can um, ostensibly extract topics from very large documents in clusters. So you find out where particular words or topics, which are clusters of words really, um, where they tend to cohere. And you can begin to see how clusters form. Um, the problem I see is that when you get the results out of it, most of us go by gut instinct. Like, oh, that looks like it makes sense. And so we tend to then fall back on what we think we already know. And I'm really interested in what I don't already know. Yeah, that's great. Every topic, every conversation I've ever had about topic modeling talk, has, it always includes someone saying, I like that one. Yes. Let's choose that topic. Exactly. That's really and that's what I'm really concerned about. Yeah. Um, so, and I'm still developing my mathematical understanding of the algorithms involved in order to be able to make a, a more informed intervention in that process. Yeah. And the reason I ask is that it occurred to me that with the, with the sort of three-pronged approach you have here, it seems like you don't ever have to get to the point where you're making a choice about topics because um, what you can, and you sort of referred to Steve Ramsey, this is a very Steve Ramsey idea, although probably a lesser version of, of something he would say, but like trying to combine, asking, asking the question, how is, how are the visual codes of the printed page how do they relate to certain topics um, as the sort of topic modeling software produces them? Yes. So it seems like you could find, in a similar way to the sort of the big graphical mm -hmm. um, map you should be threw up, find those clusters without having to ever choose which topics matter, because um, because you're looking at a set of uh, over, overlapping relationships. Exactly. What do you think? Which are mathematical relationships? Right. Yes, absolutely. That's where I'm. That's where I'm heading. You know, in the, over the next couple of years, we'll continue this, this conversation because, um, you know, we think we know, for instance, the um, themes that tend to be showing up in blank verse, right? Blank verse is used for poetry about wars and heroism, among other things. Um, and so if you run topic models on, so using the, this tool to find the blank verse, that's the first stage. And then, OK, let's take the linguistic content of those poems. What can we discover about it? And then you know, where does that take us to the next step of exploration? These are, these are tools for um, combining different angles of approach. I love it. Um, so you could imagine something like, and this isn't even a question, but you could imagine something like even asking, asking about the relationships between types and exceptions, which in so many ways is what Bourdieu is concerned Yes. Um, and sort of, so asking the question, um, how are the things Christina Rossetti talks about in her poems, how do they cluster with respect to all of these other more or less anonymous poets and poems out there? Yes. And you can imagine, uh, and I'm going to use one of those terms, a heat map that, that sort of lets you get mm -hmm. a sense of the literary field simply by, its vir the, by virtue of the relationship between this one exception, um, Christina Rossetti, and all the, all the types out there? Yes. Not even a question, just wanted to get yes. okay. and, and not much of an answer except <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is very much where I would like to, you know, explore further. Um, and especially because in some ways, you know, if, um, the stuff of poetry is thought to be working from a very limited set, right? Poems are about love, they're about death. Um, you know, there's not very many more variants on those basic themes. Um, but, but of course there's other stuff happening. But um, to be able to move out of old models of like imitation is bad but influence is good. Um, and we call, you know, we call somebody a derivative copy, of, you know, trying to imitate Tennyson. But, um, you know, only if we're valuing the illusions that one poet makes to another do we, you know. This gives us new ways of talking about the relationships that exist 
inevitably among generations of poets, among individual poets, among particular works. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a, a really beginner question. Could you go back to your, your slide about the, with the notes of publishers? Sure. Um, oh, crap, this is a Mac, so let me see here. Um, all right. Can, can you explain to me what the lines are and what the dots sure, are? Sure, sure. So the dots are, um, and I, I, I simplified it because obviously I was trying to give you the, whole, the field, like the messiness and bigness of the field. Well, which meant, and it's a great representation of, of what we're just talking about, period. Just, to, I mean, could show students this and, and, and say, this is the literary field. Yes, okay. and, and I'm interested in like, being able to map the literary field. And digital tools let us do this. You know, I, read, I first read Bourdieu long before we could do anything like this. And, and so it's really exciting to me to begin to think about how can we translate the theories that are most important to us into practices, into analytics. OK, so the, dot, the, the, the nodes are publishers and poets. And they're sized by the number of connections or edges that exist. So Simkin Marshall is a large dot because it has a lot of connections to particular poets. I could have colored poets and publishers different colors to make it even more clear, um, but it got, it's too visually, it's too messy if you're looking at this big of a section of the network. So those, those lines are the books, essentially. The lines are the books. The lines are the books. So here is a poet who published his book with Simpkin Marshall. And that, that book is the line. The book instantiates the relationship between a poet and a publisher. All right, and so the red lines mean that those are? Those are books. Books that and, were published by that publisher. Uh-huh. So Bell and Daldi is a huge publisher of poetry in mid-century. And you can see that with, with those books. And the gray lines are published. We don't know who. The gray lines are, are the other books published. I was just highlighting the ones by those are the four. Dots, publishers there? dots are both, the large dots are publishers and the smaller dots are, are poets. Oh, okay. And so to reverse, so here I've highlighted poets. And again, they're still size relative to the number of connections. Um, Tennyson has about 10 or 12 books published in 1866 with different publishers. That's very unusual. But his status as, as you know, most popular and poet laureate meant that he was circulating in the, in the poetic field in a way that most poets wouldn't be. Most poets are like all of these other ones, one poet to one publisher. And so that's actually, this is, I think, my, the best slide of the bunch. Because you can see the difference. Most Poets and publishers are just going to be a one-to-one -one relationship, um, which was interesting to me. I didn't. I expected that for the poets, but not for the publishers. And the 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 rate at which publishers were only publishing one book of poems in a given year, um, that was really interesting. And just the hundreds of publishers that. Um, and and. The next step in this, of course, there are ways to begin clustering those publishers. So publishers of religious verse, for instance, um, are a very distinct category. Those books look really different from books published for an upper class aestheticist audience. Okay? The, you know, the themes, economics, audience, and aesthetics of the poetry itself is often transformed into the visual codes of the books as well. Does the length of the lines mean anything? No, that's a side effect of the algorithm that distributes the um, information. So they're on top of each other. Yeah, it's just trying to make it readable. It's, um, it's kind of, it strikes me that it's actually, this makes it possible to do something that's almost impossible to imagine doing any other way, which is creating 
I mean, it making Shakespeare and Tennyson contemporaries. I mean, that it's a complete, to make mm -hmm. literary history synchronic. Which, of course, in very real and important ways, Shakespeare is a really significant Victorian author because of the 19th century editions of Shakespeare that completely rewrote who Shakespeare was. I mean, the invention of Shakespeare, the icon, really happens at the t between the 18th and the 19th centuries. And the biographical reading of Shakespeare's sonnets is a 19th century invention that transforms the reading of all sorts of other things. And Charles Laporte is, has been doing some great work on these um, in crazy, weird, wonderful Victorian books that read the Bible and Shakespeare together and often like matched up these sort of like hymnals of Shakespeare where they would take a passage out of Shakespeare and then say, well, this is just like Psalm 34. And, <laughs> and you know, like, so, so yeah, it, it helps us see that our history of literature based on birth and death dates and on original publication dates is not the only kind of chronology to pay attention to. That subsequent editions, I mean, there's a whole other sort of like layer about subsequent editions and reprint editions and so forth um, that's really important in understanding what poetry meant for a 19th century reader. A 19th century reader of poetry was reading as much, um, you know, Shakespeare and Milton, or some readers were, as they were reading, and Goldsmith, as they were reading Longfellow. That big dot Longfellow. Yeah, yeah. Longfellow is so understudied considering his importance in the 19th century. That tells us something too. Yes. That we ought to be aware of. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know these 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 kinds of um, visualizations um, open up more than they answer, right? I mean, this, op this, for me, I look at this and I see about 20 research papers um, that I want to go and dig into. Um, you know, it can answer certain kinds of questions, but then each of those then leads to more. Yeah, John, you were going to say something? Oh, OK. Question number two. I'm okay. being silly. I don't have 19. <laughs> um, so let's say we were to overlay this graph with, um, um, with, the, um, with the compiled poetic, uh, I can't remember the terms you use now. The, let's, can, what if we were to find a way to overlay this with the compiled information from the OCR mm -hmm. um, poetic form software? What am I trying to say? So the uh, extracted formal features yes, of the pages. So, uh -huh. um, would it, first of all, would it be possible to do that? Like, could we, could we find a way to overlay this data with that mm -hmm. data in yes. such a way that we could, we could possibly see relationships between um, publishers, uh, poets, yes. and, and forms? Absolutely. And I've been doing this on a very small scale. Okay. Um, so one of, one of the tests, for instance, of this kind of approach is to see, um, I expect, from what I already know about the publishing of poetry, that books published by Macmillan look different from books published by Strahan, for instance, which is published a lot of religious poetry. I know they look different to my human eye. So question number one, do they look, are they quantitatively different, computationally different, if you're analyzing them in this way? Yes, in fact, they are. OK. Um, if we were to look at books by particular publishers, does the computer already cluster? If you're just looking at the formal features, are the clusters that you get in the data set already sorted by publisher? Mm -hmm. Sometimes they are which then shows us, OK, there's something distinctive in the designs that this publisher was using. Um, so yes, absolutely. That's a very small step towards, towards that kind of combination that you're talking about. OK, so this leads me to my question, which is my, 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 my more important question, which is, if we were to be able to do that, um, thinking about what you said, you quoted Mac, that wonderful McGann quote about visual interfaces. Mm -hmm. um, my question about that to McGann and now to you is always, if if if, if Poetic, or if books provide graphic interfaces, what kinds of transactions do they afford? Um, How might that overlay allow us to answer such a question? One way is to think about the affordances available to readers of particular socioeconomic groups or regional groups. 
which using the historical metadata as an overlay lets you do. Um, and especially if you move beyond London publishers to include Scottish publishers, for instance, um, you, you get very, some really different things happening. Are these all London? Yeah, these are all London. Um, you know, I have big dreams of making this like bigger, I mean, this is the, the sorcerer's soup pot or whatever, the thing that keeps growing and never, you know, you can't get it to stop boiling over. Um, you have to start small. And so I start, you know, start with just London publishers, small data sets to figure out the processes. But um, so, so you do see certain, certain kinds of differences that the historical metadata allow us to explore and understand. Um, and the visual page project as a whole is, I mean, ultimately I'm interested in questions that we can't answer because we can't conduct, or I can't conduct seances with Victorian readers to find out, like, how did this page design make you feel? How did, you know, how, how did you read Christina Rossetti's poems? Did they look different from other kinds of books of poetry, right? There are certain questions about the history of reading that we are never going to be able to, like, definitively answer. But that doesn't mean that the visual design of the page is irrelevant to the reading experience. Um, certainly we know there are plenty of examples in published reviews and so forth where reviewers comment on distinctive designs, well-made books or book designs they don't like. There were conventions in place. This helps us see what were those big picture conventions. Um, the, the conventions that are so unremarked, that's Bourdieu's term again, that were so obvious and many of which are unremarked to us today because we're still the inheritors of a lot of these 19th century printing traditions. So that we think it's obvious that poetry would look the way most of these books look. But it's not obvious in the longer history of the book as a form. I mean, one, of those, sorry, one of those research questions strikes me in that it would be useful to know how many books were sold from a particular publisher just because they have put out an edition, let's say right. they sold five for one and another sold for five hundred. Right. And sales figures are notoriously difficult yeah. to get. Um, you know, when we have them, they're not an index for reading either because Victorian reading practices meant that a given book would typically be read aloud or shared among a large number of people in a household. There were other people, of course, who then as now purchased books simply to have them displayed on their shelf and never read them at all. Um, so the, you know, um, also this is a period of incredible growth in lending libraries. And you know, the, the role of the lending library means that books circulate in ways that we can't necessarily measure. We don't have good um, subscriber or circulation records for most of those libraries. So um, absolutely, there are layers of economic data in particular and production data. Sizes of print runs vary wildly for poetry's publication in this period, mostly pretty small, except when you're looking at Longfellow, Tennyson, Wordsworth. Um, and, um, and different publishers had very different practices of, um, you know, it's very common 19th century publishers are always like just reprinting an edition, but they're calling it a third edition. It's really an issue, not an, not an edition in bibliographic terms. Um, there are a lot of complicating factors. Um, but, uh, but yeah, absolutely, that would be interesting to, to weave in here somehow. Um, this is a really probably boring question after all, all this discussion, but I'm just wondering, in, on a practical level, mm -hmm. doing this research uh, on like technical skills and how have you built uh, that expertise and, and for the grant funded project particularly? The okay. Visual page, what, what does your like, collaborative team look like or do you have people that you're also working with? On? It's, a, it's a really great question because it's something that um, <coughs> should be part of our conversations about digital humanities, absolutely. So um, my own technical expertise, um, is what I was, you know, a moderate level. Um, I'm very comfortable with quantitative data, um, and I can create a database, and I can write in a couple of different programming languages when I need to, and I use R for my statistical analyses and so forth. 
Um, and a lot of those are skills that I developed because I wanted to do this work, right? I had never used R for um, statistical analysis and visualization until I started doing some of this work. And then I, I learned it so that I could do it, um, which for me is how I learn anything. You know, I have to have a motivation for learning it. Um, the Visual Page Project, I'm collaborating with Neil, who's a computer scientist. Um, so he's doing the um, uh, software engineering on Tesseract, um, the, all of the back end stuff. Um, I'm doing the statistical um, analysis of the data and the visualizations. And we're, we're working together, and we have a, and there's a, a um, we have the assistance of um, somebody for some of the web design work. Um, but it's a very small project. It's basically me and Neil. <laughs> um, and, and I want to say it's been a fantastic collaboration. I feel really privileged to have that opportunity to, work, you know, to find someone in a very different discipline who already had shared interest in the visual structures of printed texts. We, we met at a VAT camp. We discovered we had the shared interest. And then it just sort of worked out from there that we put together a grant proposal to do this work. Um, and so, because it's very small, that you know, that means the work is slow. Sometimes this is a not the main project for either of us, um, but uh, but it's been a really productive collaboration in that way. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for all of your questions and conversations. It's been really fun.